Hello everyone, welcome back to the Brain Food Vlog. I'm Dr. Drew Ramsey, I'm an advisor to Medscape Psychiatry and I'm gonna let everybody gather for a few minutes, but every week, Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, we've been having a conversation about mental health, about food, with the hope of really trying to empower all of you out there on the front lines to think about your mental health, to take care of your mental health. So everybody, thanks for the hearts, thanks for signing in. I'm really excited about today's episode because I'm gonna be joined by one of my real original teammates and friends when it comes to food and psychiatry. Her name's Emily Deans and she's gonna join us in just a few minutes. She's a instructor of psychiatry at Harvard University. She is a, a psychiatrist in active clinical practice and she's just a, a great person. She also, back in the day, was really one of the original people writing about food and mental health. This is like 2008, 2009. She has a great blog called Evolutionary Psychiatry. And I know for me, when I began to work on my first book, The Happiness Diet, I just I was so drawn to her content and uh, how she she really got into the, the, the details of the science um, around certain nutrients like magnesium and how they affect our mental health. And so Emily's gonna, Dr. Deans is gonna join us right now and, uh, and we'll get started talking all about brain food. And here she is. Hi, hi, Drew, how are you? I'm doing great, Emily, it's so nice to oh see you. Oh my gosh, it's good to see you. It's been You're a awesome. while, it's been a while since we've seen each other in person, so it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's strange to pop in and see you, uh, <laughs> see you like Here. this, but, but hello, welcome to Medscape. I was just telling everybody a little bit about how we met, which is that, that I found your blog when I was writing that, The Happiness Diet. Actually, uh, Tyler, my co-wrote the book, was like, do you know this psychiatrist, Emily Deans? And I was like, no. And I became an instant fan because your blog, oh, uh, your blog is you know, just so informative, so up to date on the science. And, and so I wanted to bring you on today uh, to talk to our audience here around the world. Uh, this Medscape family, we, we, we meet up on Thursdays at four. And I, I kind of consider you one of the original brain foodies. And so... Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I remember the first time I met you, Drew, and I think it was at the APA, or it was at a conference, and we were supposed to meet, and you just came running down the stairs, you know, because <laughs> I didn't even know you, and you like gave me a hug. I'm like, oh, hi, Drew, how are you? And yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of, it's always a lot of fun to talk to psychiatrists and other people who are really interested in food and mood and mental health. So, you know, it, always uh, the best of times and the best of friends. That does, that does sound like me. I'm a little enthusiastic <laughs> for fellow brain foodies and fellow psychiatrists. So that's true. Well, I, I wanted to, and everybody drop some questions in. Um, we're getting folks joining from all over uh, South Korea. Um, as I've said every week from Palestine, um, this is one of my favorite parts is we get to talk to you all all over the world and, and share some of what we're experiencing here uh, in, in mental health and in psychiatry and in nutrition, but also hear from you all and answer some of your questions. And so we'll definitely drop questions in the comments and we'll get to those as we, uh, as we progress along. Emily, I guess I wanted to start just right now because you're a psychiatrist in active practice and there are uh, lots of people struggling with their mental health during quarantine, during COVID. And I, I kind of wonder from the 30,000 foot view kind of what you're seeing clinically in your practice and um, how, and how quarantine you feel is kind of, I guess, affecting people and their mental health. Uh, so just as a general question, um... I would say at the beginning of quarantine, so I'm in Massachusetts, we were hit pretty hard, pretty early, just similar to New York City in February, March, our peak was in April. And originally, you know, everything closed down pretty hardcore uh, mid-April, I'm uh, sorry, mid-March. And um, originally people were pretty anxious, got lots of people, you know, lots of my folks who need some sleeping meds every once in a while called me, asked for a re, re out for their sleeping medication, that kind of thing. But interestingly, um, except for substance abuse, which I think got a lot worse because people are sort of bored and have nothing else to do and are very busy. Um, but for, you know, depression, anxiety, and even some of your paranoid psychotic disorders, that kind of thing, they actually sort of toned down when everything closed down. They knew where all their family was. 
They knew everybody was safe. They didn't have anywhere to go. They didn't have to put all that effort to put on a happy face to be, you know, something that they weren't feeling. Um, and they improved for that few months. Um, and lately, though, with uh, Massachusetts, we're reopening. Um, and everyone's expecting to go back in, to school in the fall. And lots of questions about that. And uh, seeing lots more anxiety now. Um, Food-wise, that's interesting, too, because a lot of people are at home and kind of eating their feelings. Um, but they're not going out to eat as much. They're not stopping on the way and getting a Dunkin' Donuts with, cre you know, cre creamy things. So some people have actually been losing a lot of weight and exercising a lot more and do being a lot more active. And other people have actually been gaining a lot of weight. They're, they, they call it the COVID-15, the COVID-20. Um, so it's it's been sort of an interesting dynamic. Very different. You know, I've been practicing long enough. You can see the, the gray hair. Um, that I had started practicing, or I was working in the hospitals during 9-11, and almost everybody with uh, underlying mental illness got worse during that. Also during the um, crisis of 2007, pretty much everybody got worse. So it's been interesting to see this crisis with people kind of actually getting better for a short period of time when you know they were off the hamster wheel. So mental health wise, that's what I've been seeing. Yeah, it's really interesting to see that spectrum of, you know, first we have that personal individualized response, but also the kind of the arc of it or the, the, the various phases of, you know, especially in the beginning, that anxiety where we didn't know what it was going to be like. You didn't know. How, right. Yeah. We didn't know, like, gosh, can you touch your Amazon packages or you can do like put them in quarantine. <laughs> right. For people days. spraying bleach and, like, on all their spray, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Spraying yeah. alcohol and bleach on everything, on my children. I mean, it really was. <laughs> You know, a lot of insomnia. And then I agree, seeing some people, I put myself in that list who kind of like, I don't know, did a little better. I, I stopped yeah. eating, you know, I had more time for my family. I'm cooking at home every night. Yeah, we get to all sleep in. My kid gets to, she doesn't have to be at the, at the bus stop at 7 a.m., you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You don't even know if I'm wearing like pants right now. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's like everything's done on Zoom. So it's, uh, it's definitely been a variable response. I, I wanted to talk a little bit, because you're a general psychiatrist who's, who's food friendly, talks about food, knows about nutritional psychiatry. And we've got a question here from Margaret Pop. How do you know a patient needs brain food? And huh. that's, that's a really good question. And my answer would always be to meet a patient where they are. So it, not everybody's ready to change their food, to change their diet. So I'm always going to ask them about what's going on in their life. And I always ask them, you know, what do you eat? What, would, what did you have for breakfast? And not judgmentally, I'm just really curious about everything in their life. And that's just one piece of it. And it, that's, once you get at that information about where they are, then you very slowly use sort of a motivational interviewing technique to um, adjust where they're going to go. So you can say, oh, you know, every breakfast, you have like some sort of weird protein bar or you go out to Dunkin' Donuts and just have, sorry, I'm in Massachusetts. We do a lot of Dunkin' Donuts. Um, <laughs> but you, you just have a, an iced coffee with lots of sugar and hazelnut or whatever it is. Can we adjust that? Can we make it more nutritious? Can we make it healthier? And even just adjusting one thing at a time, you can get a lot of progress with people and feeling better. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the core tenets of nutritional psychiatry really is, is around moving away from this kind of dogmatic, like, this is how you have to eat. Uh, and really, as you said, meeting patients where they are and trying to partner with them. That even if it's like, there was a question earlier about nuts. I think we're both fans of nuts that are good. You love nuts, yeah. You know, they're a good snack. They're a whole natural food. They've got lots of phytonutrients, lots of fiber, lots of... I, don't know, I like nuts because it's like, if I want some vitamin E, I go for my almond. <laughs> if I need a little like ALA omega-3, I grab some walnuts. If I want a little more iron in my nut, I grab some cashews. Um, but, you know, understanding where somebody is and what, what they're feeling in terms of their, their readiness to change, I think is a part a lot of people miss. I'd also argue, we probably both agree that all brains need more nutrient-dense food, at least for people who are living in that kind of standard American ultra-processed food diet. Right. So any reduction in ultra processed food, any reduction, honestly, in the alcohol budget of the diet, any reduction in, I'm sorry, my dog is right here. We're dog friendly. <laughs> We're dog friendly here on Metscape. We love the dogs. Um, all right. It's just going away now. Um, but any reduction in the, the 
sugar, processed food, that kind of stuff. More, we talk about all the um, farm farmers markets that are around and where you can buy it and where you can purchase food and what you can do. Um, it, all of those practical tips for the local environment where you are, that's what people find is helpful. And when you, you know, people are practicing the inner cities, food deserts, things like that. There's still places you can go, canned clams. And, you know, we were in Atlanta together and we were trying to get together a presentation on a real food. And all we had was a CVS in downtown Atlanta. There were no grocery stores. There was nothing. I mean, like the definition of a food de desert. And we found um, radicchio and canned clams and all sorts of healthy, nutrient-rich foods. But you kind of had to know what you were looking for and look for it. I just love that point you made, which I think often gets missed, which is, and you make this point really well about omega-3 and omega-6 fats, which is it's not just loading in all the brain foods. What's really actually probably more helpful to patients is cutting out the processed foods. And yeah. Of course, you need to replace those with whole foods, but every time you have a patient move from something that's packaged, ultra-processed, you know, a million ways to say sugar, lots and lots of usually corn, soy, palm oil, some fat that we generally don't think is healthy, and swap that out for really kind of anything that is more whole foods, that's a real win for the patient. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll talk to patients about where they can get cheap avocado oil, like Costco, um, or cheap olive oil, um, like uh, Trader Joe's, uh, something in, that's kind of suburban, again, but a, a lot of these places, it's really not without your budget. Um, Costco, they have the $6.00 rotisserie chicken that you can add to anything. You could add to salad. Um, these are all things that make really simple, easy meals that you can do over and over. I'm a big fan too of freezer friendly foods like chili, lentil soup, all these, you know, these cheap, easy things that you can do you can just with one pot and not that many ingredients. Um, but people feel overwhelmed. They don't know how to cook. They don't, the timing is overwhelming. The planning is overwhelming. That's something, honestly, the pandemic has been good. Lots of people have had to figure out cooking on their own, <laughs> freezing, eating the same meals over and over. Um, and we've been able to have that conversation a little bit more than usual right now. So that's been a bit interesting. It has been really interesting just to see the way that, you know, everybody's cooking dinner at home. I mean, uh, and it, it's been, I think, really wonderful for people to remember, you know, that, that good cooking really isn't that complicated. It's about fresh ingredients, olive oil. It's about a slow cooker. It's about, you know, slowing down, taking a deep breath and enjoying real food. So uh, it, it has been really interesting to see that kind of shift. And it's also, I think it's a fun time to have food as part of your practice. Because, you know, as you're talking about, I don't know, I felt like in the first couple months, I was going over like quarantine basics. Like, right, 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 cleaning where, your hands and, and yeah, like where, where are like, you getting where are you getting sanitizer and do you have do you have food? Yep, um, yeah, can, do you have, do you have toilet paper? <laughs> yeah. We both know there's this yeah. thing called food insecurity, which everybody also experienced. A lot of people experience for the first time. Millions of folks around the world have food insecurity. It's just not knowing where your next meal exactly is going to come from, not feeling secure in your food supply. And a lot of us, you know, experienced that really head on. You went to the grocery store for the first time. It's like, wow, like my produce isn't here. And it, it was a real wake up call. I think it also allowed us to, to kind of lean into more of those foods that, you know, oftentimes we don't like move towards like, like frozen vegetables, which are oftentimes much healthier than fresh vegetables that they get frozen at the time, at their peak ripeness. I think you got um, oh. They store forever. They're sort of better for, um, you know, we've all had that experience, right? Where it's like, you know, you bought the mescaline salad mix and it turned to goo in the bottom of your fridge because you missed it. And so, <laughs> right, the rotter. It's it's not it's not yeah. the vegetable thing. It's the rotter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're um, getting some great questions, everybody. Thanks so much for for all the hearts. There's some questions. What we're talking about this is the Brain Food Blog. I'm Drew Ramsey. I'm a psychiatrist, usually based in New York. I'm on the Medscape Advisory Board for uh, Medscape Psychiatry. And I'm with Dr. Emily Deans, who's a psychiatrist. She's an instructor at, at Harvard University. And she's one of the real original movers and shakers in the brain food space. As I think about her, she was doing it before I was doing it. And has a great blog, Evolutionary Psychiatry. It really goes into great detail. But Emily's also just one of my favorite psychiatrists, just because she's a really good, experienced psychiatrist. And oftentimes, in the integrative health space, um, you know, how do I put this? Uh, that balanced view that you have, I think sometimes is missing. 
we're getting some uh, some questions about our favorite molecule, sugar, glucose. <laughs> And people are asking, you know, why, why is sugary food so tasty and why does it make our mood go up? Why do we reach for the chocolate cake and the candy bar? Why, after like a stressful thing, do we like, you know, <clears throat> glance both ways and hit the vending machine for some candy? What, 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 why, what, what's this molecule? Why is this so popular for us? Uh, so this is funny. I have some, I have two old blogs that you can search. One of them's called Do Carbs Make You Crazy? And another one's called Do Carbs Make You Sane? And it talks about how glucose, um, it, basically what it does is it couples with insulin and increases serotonin production um, and then melatonin production. So you get happy and, you know, serotonin is the happy, um, it's the, co you know, when you're cuddling a baby or cuddling your dog or scratching something or, or you see a chimpanzee like picking, picking at their relatives and being cozy and huggy, that's, that's the serotonin hormone. It's, it's the warm affection, loving hormone coupled with um, oxytocin and some other things. And um, serotonin becomes melatonin. So if you have high levels of serotonin, then you get melatonin, then it's easier for you to sleep. Um, and so there was, uh, for a while, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I think this is way too simplistic, um, but there was a big push um, in the media that serotonin and, and high, high, high carb foods would help you be happier and help you go to sleep and all that kind of stuff. Um, the downside of that is that insulin giveth and <laughs> <laughs> insulin giveth and insulin taketh away, I think is where they come from. You yeah. know, 90 minutes, 90 minutes after I eat a bunch of marshmallows, I have a sugar crash and I'm a mess, right? Um, and low, so insulin comes out and then it's um, crashes your sugar. And then you get, it's like PMS, you get angry, and you get agitated. So um, you don't want too many high uh, peaks of your sugar or too many low crashes of your sugar, you really want regular amounts of your sugar. Um, so sugar can make you kind of hyper and happy and, and, fetch, and even sleep better. You know, you eat a nice um, dinner with a dessert and you get a nice sleep, um, but the crash can actually wake you up. I have people who wake up in the middle of the night after a high sugar, you know, they might eat like orange juice before bed or crackers before bed or whatever it is. They wake up 90 minutes later with a panic attack because their insulin and their sugar crashed and then they get a um, resultant cortisol surge. Um, so keeping it all even and keeping your sugar relatively low and more balanced overall is better. And I think it's also when you're gonna go for the sweets, go to those sweets that are a little more brain food, right? Which is, you know, like a dark chocolate bar that's 70 or berries, or yeah. chocolate, or you know, I just hit the cacao nibs and cacao beans straight up these days. Or, you know, if you're really craving carbs, you know, have it be like, Know, potato salad where the cooled potatoes have a more resistant starch and so I think there are lots of ways you know not, not that you can't have candy occasionally but you know where you want to have a, a, a kind of smarter game plan for those carb cravings so you're getting more whole food based carbohydrates and you're not getting those uh, sugar crashes in, um, in my yard honest we have some wild black raspberries and I go out there and I'll, I'll pick 10 or 20 and give some to my kids and there's tons of fiber and they don't give you that much sugar, but they're really sweet and they're really awesome. And the berries are, are really good. If you really want a nice sweet um, surprise in the summer, berries are good because the high fiber means that your sugar is not going to go up and crash. It really controls things. I think, yeah, those low, low glycemic roots are, are great. And I think just a great way to add in, you know, when I think about, um, again, healthy ways to add sweetness into your diet. We're not trying to like deny people the pleasure of eating. I think in some ways we're trying to enhance it. So there's less guilt. There's more, there's more pleasure. Um, there's been a question about uh, someone says they've seen a report that suicide is going to go up once COVID is settled. Now I haven't seen that report, but I'm just kind of curious about your reaction to a statement like that. Um, you know, that's an interesting question because I think, there has been some um, signals that mental health issues are going up. Now, it's different in different countries. So in Japan, 
in April is where people tend to start school. They, they have a little different school year than the rest of the, than the rest of the country or the rest of the world. And they actually had their suicide because they didn't go back to school in April. Their suicide um, rate actually dropped by 20% this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't, it, again, that was what we were talking about at the beginning with my patients who were, were taken off the hamster wheel. We don't have to do as much. We're, we're safe. We're at home. Things are different in different countries. Uh, people have different amounts. You know, here we got a surplus, the unemployment increase, that kind of thing help people out. But other people are very much more insecure. Um, so there are lots of different questions in different countries about what this might um, entail. I haven't seen, you know, in the U.S., I don't think there's been a huge increase in suicidal ideation or suicidal activity so far that I've heard about. The major increase I have heard about is substance abuse Um, with people with more time on their hands, not much to do. That has been a real crisis and I think something to deal with. Yeah, and certainly, you know, that can certainly obviously influence suicide of just as people drink and do drugs, they lose impulse control, they have more extreme thoughts. Um, just another great, I love all these great questions, everybody. Thanks everyone for your hearts and your comments. This is a great question about vitamin C and people are getting advised to eat more vitamin C during COVID. Um, and, and then the question is sort of how does that tie into nutritional psychiatry? And, and, you know, vitamin C is interesting to me because it's just, you know, when you look at its chemical structure, it's like one methyl group away from being glucose, which I always, and, and it's one of those things that like all the other mammals make, but where most of them do and we don't. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's, um, but I guess curious about your thoughts on vitamin C and mental health. I know that was one of the nutrients that came out in a paper that um, our colleague Laura LaChance and I published, the antidepressant food scale, where we looked at all the scientific literature and, and all of the vitamins and minerals and found 12 vitamins and minerals that really most uh, highly related to the prevention and treatment of depression, and vitamin C was one of them. I mean, I think vitamin C is a marker for fresh food, for um, citrus fruits, for vegetables and plants. And I think people who eat those things are healthier and happier. Um, You know, vitamin C is important really when people have higher glucose as well. Um, And it's a, it's a good antioxidant. Um, uh, If people are asking me if, you know, obviously people have these questions, especially with vitamin D and and some other uh, zinc, uh, does that prevent COVID? Um, I, I don't think we have any evidence for that. Unfortunately, with vitamin D, the healthier you are, the higher your vitamin D tends to be, and the un- more unhealthy you are, the lower it tends to be. So those markers are, are fairly unreliable. Zinc certainly um, could probably help with immunity. I don't have any problem with people taking you know, the RDA or double the RDA or eating lots of oysters, which has a high level of zinc. Um, and, and vitamin C would be similar. I, I think we should definitely be taking our vitamin. I don't think we need to mega dose it. Um, but, it, you know, any foods high in vitamin C are going to be good for you. So we should be eating them. I was really surprised when I started learning about nutrition, how low the daily recommended daily uh, recommended allowance of uh, recommended daily allowance rather of vitamin C is like 87 milligrams or something. And so, you know, a cup of kale, you get 130 percent, you know, oysters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just it, but it's a great. I love your comment that you know, really, if you're eating fresh, eating more plants, right, more crunchy vegetables, more low glycemic fruits, you don't have to worry about vitamin C. You're going to get lots and lots of vitamin C. It's one of the reasons that that you know, citrus fruits and um, and kale and, and and leafy greens are just great to add into your diet. Um, here is a not exactly a question. I just wanted to respond. So we have uh, this is from He He Twelve Smile. We don't have a food desert in South Korea. But healthy foods like fruit and vegetables are super expensive, and people would rather mm. eat cheap, high carb foods like ramen. And and I I think that that's something that we all run into that we we um, we've been sold in some ways a false bill of goods in my mind that the efficiency model, which exists in so many aspects of our life, right, the less you can pay and the faster you can get it done, the better. That 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 really isn't true when it comes to food. And and, um, and and it takes out the full cost that when you're living a life on processed foods, um, your food budget might be low, but your medication and medical budget is going to over time get really, really high. Your disability is going to go up as you are having the sequela of chronic illness that comes with processed food. But I'm wondering, like, what are some of your hacks uh, around saving money for fresh fruits and vegetables? 
Um, so certainly frozen foods. I mean, you can go to the store, at least in the U.S., and I can go to the store and get a huge bag of frozen broccoli or green beans or, or corn or whatever it is for a dollar. Um, the other hack that I have are, are, is local farmer's markets. They tend to be actually quite a lot cheaper than the grocery store. You get a lot of food. They will often have uh, blogs, recipes, email service, you know, where they tell you, to make bit of you know you get the radishes but you also get the radish tops you can take the radish tops you can use it for salad you can use it for pesto there are lots of things you could do um with the entire plant that when you went to the grocery store and just bought radishes you know you wouldn't get all that and and they're cheaper and they're fresher um you know generally the locals farmers market uh, you can purchase a farm share if you don't have the cash for the farmers market and you have time Often they will accept donations of labor um, so that you can get food. Um, even in the cities around here, they have farmer's markets in certain areas of town where you can go and, and purchase fresh fish, fresh meat, um, straight from the butcher, um, fresh bacon, and then lots of fresh vegetables. So m the farmer's markets are my favorite hack. And then frozen foods um, in, in this time. And, you know, we did, honestly, uh, we did have our share of, it, at the beginning of all this, I was out at the grocery store and I'm like, what if we can't leave the house for two weeks because we're quarantined because we're sick? And I bought a bit of ramen and fair <laughs> thing. And you know what? You mix them up with some frozen peas or some frozen green beans and um, sort of extend the, the nutrient profile of them. But they, they shouldn't be our primary foods. It should really be more lean meats, uh, meats, vegetables, um, you know, and less of the, the pasta and the, and the um, processed foods, uh, macaroni and cheese. I did, I bought boxes of those, <laughs> again, for my quarantine food, just in case. Well, I mean, I think that's also where this concept of dietary pattern comes in. Yeah. It's not that you never eat pasta or macaroni and cheese or ramen. I love ramen, but it's- Yeah, but you mix you it up, really, yeah. You really try and, in those meals, increase the nutrient density. So I had a patient some years ago who was a really- very impoverished. She was in graduate school. She was really interested in nutrition, but she, you know, she had no money. She was living in New York on like 800 bucks a month, which is kind of impossible. And she had ramen. And I said, well, tell me about the ramen. She said, well, I try and be really healthy and get some seafood. So I put a tin of sardines on there. Yeah, great. Yeah. All of a sudden, that's like one of the top brains. <laughs> yeah. you know, so I think there's a way to take that ramen meal. And maybe that's where you are. Maybe that's what you got on the table tonight. How can you kind of bump up the nutrient density? And usually the food categories you think about nutritional psychiatry, you want to look toward, can you chop up some leafy greens? Because leafy greens are really the most nutrient dense food category. And just drop them in there. They're going to they're gonna kind of wilt and cook in the, in the hot broth. And if you look at traditional ramen soups, I just spent a, 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 some time in Japan. And, you know, there's a bevy of vegetables. There's all kinds of really healthy stuff in the Scallions, ramen. you know, all the, yeah. Galleons. There's also a way that you, you know, swap, swap that ramen out for a soba noodle. And um, for the first time in my life, I made dashi, the really, really, you know, that, that um, basic fundamental Japanese broth. So easy to make at home. It's just some bonito flakes and some um, seaweed. And, you know, all of a sudden it feels like you're like making a made, or you are making great, great uh, noodle soups and then just packing the veggies in there as well. So... It one of my favorite, just like last two go to, I don't even know what we're doing. We only have canned food um, hacks is um, tuna salad. And you either have to have mayonnaise on hand or be, you know, have some eggs and some oil to make mayonnaise, which is pretty easy if you have an immersion blender. Um, but all you need are carrots and celery, which last in the fridge for a long time. And then I mix up uh, canned tuna and actually I usually throw in some canned sardines to increase the omega-3 and the kids don't even notice, you know, they don't know. Um, and that's a really easy meal to make. If, if you haven't been to the store in three weeks, you're going to have some carrots and celery left over and all, all the rest of the stuff is canned. So it's, it's really easy. I'm going to pass that recipe on one of my patients had like a hundred cans of tuna at the beginning of quarantine. It's like, <laughs> I loaded up and like it, halfway through it, I was like, how's the tuna going? He's like, I haven't touched it. <laughs> and so, so I love that also recipe where I use wild salmon from a, from a jar, from a can, where, you know, you get just to kind of, again, mix up the diversity of, of the seafood in, in our diet. 
Um, there's a recommendation here also to start growing vegetables, especially, you know, no matter where you are, when we were living in the city of New York, I had a window box. I grew all these fresh herbs, even grew some cherry tomatoes. So, you know, anytime you can, can grow a little bit of food on your own, it's really, it's, it's satisfying. You get a little garden therapy, um, you save yes. a little money. You know, we're, we're in the suburbs, which you would think it would make a good, good, good garden, but it's, it's not a farm situation. And we have lots of wild animals that eat, you know, if we just had a, a regular garden, it would probably be eaten all by um, animals. So we have lots of potted, um, you know, tomatoes, peppers, basil on, on the porch, right, you know, right next to the house. So if you're the like animals start the eating. Animals. Like, come yeah, on yeah, yeah, yeah. porch, see if you're that bold. <laughs> if I'm, so I'm from Texas. My dad used to protect his corn with his 22, but um, <laughs> we don't, we don't do that in the suburbs of Massachusetts. We don't shoot the squirrels with the 22, but um, it, you know, that this really works for us. And then I buy a share in the farmer's market nearby and, and that's how we can get all the, uh, the vegetables and garden stuff that um, the cucumbers and everything that we need. So yeah, there are ways to have a garden without having your own garden and having to um, chase off all the varmints. Yeah, I love, I love the small container gardens and just, you know, again, it's not gonna provide like tons and tons of calories for your family, but if you have fresh herbs that just, it, this morning we had a, uh, my kids are still, they like eggs okay. We have some chickens. I went and got some basil out of the garden, maybe like 20 leaves of fresh basil, chopped it up thinly, dropped it in with the scrambled eggs. You know, there's a serving of leafy greens for everybody. I wanna, we're gonna have to end in a couple of minutes, but we've got another great question from Mona Lamona, which is healthcare workers do not have time for healthy mm. food with a little tear emoji. Now you've been a healthcare worker for a while, as am I, uh, and I'm wondering what, what are some of your favorite tips when you know, you're on the run for our colleagues who are watching or in the hospital, um, on the front lines, maybe they don't have a lot of time, maybe they're eating at the hospital cafeteria, which, you know, unfortunately, that's often not the healthiest spot to find food. What, what are some of the ways that you stay healthy when you're busy like that? Um, uh, so to be honest, it, it takes some money. I think sometimes the healthcare, the, health, the cafeteria, sometimes you can go on the oatmeal direction and usually oatmeal, they'll have some fresh fruit and, and nuts that you can add to it for breakfast. Those kinds of things you can choose to do. Um, often they will have a salad bar with meats and, and bacon and stuff rather than some of the other choices with the cafeteria. But for me, it, you know, as a busy doctor, I actually get a lunch service um, they send us frozen meals that I keep in my office in the freezer. Um, it They do like uh, keto organic paleo meals. It's called the good kitchen. Um, I'm not getting kickbacks to, to, to say it, but they send me meals and, and they're frozen and I can just uh, cook them up. So for people with sort of more money than time, um, like a, a busy healthcare professional, I, you don't have to buy a whole lot of it. I get 15 meals a month. It's not that expensive. And it means you have a really healthy meal um, when you can use it. Uh, so I, honestly, I would say if you, have, if you have money and not time, that's what I would do it. I have someone else cater and cook the meals for you. And I think it's something we're bad at in healthcare. I'd also call that getting help which is that <laughs> yeah. you know, if somebody else makes the food and they put it in the freezer for you and that makes sure you get a healthy meal that day or when you're stressed, like, amen, like that's a win for you. I can tell you I... a couple of, and the person asks says, you know, she's a nurse. A couple of my favorite um, little tips is I love hard boiled eggs, like really just yeah, yeah. very satiating, great source of protein, keep them in the fridge at work, pop a couple down if I get too hungry. We mentioned nuts earlier. One of the reasons I really got into nuts is I just found it was like an easy snack to like, I guess this is kind of gross, but I have, have like a little bag of nuts in my lab coat. And so I go wash my hands. I also, then... I really like um, like grass fed beef jerky. Um, you can get a whole lot of those on Amazon. And if you're just like really hungry in the middle of the afternoon and you need some protein and you just grab um, the grass fed beef jerky um, stick and eat it, it lasts forever. You could, you could store it in your car. I mean, it's really easy. And you can also see we're recommending these kind of sources of protein because in general, protein is very, very satiating. And, you know, we all know you can eat a heck of a lot of carbs and keep eating them, especially processed carbs and not feel full. Um, and, and so getting, uh, I think one of the kind of things where healthcare, we really got diverted in that kind of low fat idea and sort of nonsense that it's much better if you're not going to have a lot of time to get some healthy fats, you know, um, and get some protein in there. By healthy fats for me, that's sort of olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil. Um, 
uh, grass-fed beef, and then you know any any sort of wild fish. And, and so I, I remember when I when I worked at the hospital, we snuck a lot of the graham crackers, the the sugary peanut butter, and the insure. Right, that's what we we stole in the middle of the night when we were hung, when we were really hungry. So it's important to bring your own stuff in, in residency. <laughs> it's much, much better to bring your own stuff in that's healthy, like the nuts and, and everything that you're talking about. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's certainly a challenge. I think the, the, you know, I think the bottom line for a lot of healthcare providers, because a lot of us can be kind of hard on ourselves, is that, you know, to take that next best step, that if you've noticed you've just been living off the vending machine, like head to the grocery store today, buy some celery, buy some carrots, buy stuff that's not going to spoil, get some almond butter, or peanut butter. Um, you know, put those in your locker at work. So at least, you know, you've got, you've got a, um, uh, a good healthy option. You know, it's not like you're always going to pick it, but at least you're going to pick it more of the time. And then I think also advocate for you and the rest of your healthcare workers in your cafeteria. Great example of this. I've worked with Eskenazi healthcare system in Indianapolis, Indiana. They put a, a garden on the eighth floor of the hospital. So a rooftop garden called the Sky Farm where actually um, healthcare workers are given farm plots. So you get like a little plot on the roof where it's really inspiring to go up there and see doctors and nurses on their break, kind of like getting a little garden therapy, picking some tomatoes, especially leafy greens. I mean, I grow a lot of, as you can see, my <coughs> kale. Display here. I, grow, I grow a lot of kale because it just, it drips leaves all year long. I mean, you can have one plant and you're just, you know, you pull off three or four kale leaves a day. That's a lot of kale. And so those are, I think some some ideas around um, you know what to do in healthcare, but advocate to your administration. You don't have to put a garden on the roof of your hospital, but make sure you got a great salad bar. And it's it's easy, I think, to advocate, especially now. Like, what the heck is healthcare doing if we're not modeling how to eat? If you go into a hospital and there's a fast food chain, that is not a hospital that is focused on modeling healthcare. That's not a hospital that's focused on feeding their greatest asset, which is all of you. And, and sometimes it just needs a, a kind of reminder and a couple of administrators who are on your side. And you can really, really change the food system within your healthcare system for the better. And so I really encourage everybody to, to speak up. Um, all right, last question here is eating a healthy meal better than fasting? Ooh. Mm. Why not both? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that it depends on where you are. When I'm really, really hungry and, and, I'm, and, and I'm just not, I'm not in the mood to kind of sit with that hunger because, you know, I think when we're hungry, especially as healthcare professionals, when we're hungry, you know, you got a lot of calories stored inside of you. You're going to be fine. But there's a way that, especially if you're dealing with a lot of stress or stressful clinical situations, I don't like to be super hungry in those situations. I find myself I'm more irritable and more impulsive. I don't have that real clinician stance. And then in terms of fasting, I just encourage that to be one of those things that people experiment with, kind of like oysters and seafood. If it's not part of your life, you know, try it out. Same thing with fasting, starting out with maybe intermittent fasting or eating windows, where one of the things I encourage people to do is, you know, no way to promote kind of a disordered eating, but to have people reestablish a bit of a relationship with hunger, that hunger doesn't kill you, that hunger doesn't have to derail you. Um, so, you know, those, are, and, and fasting is, is really a fascinating, uh, kind of deep well of science these days, right? If you look at kind of what, what, what we're learning about ketones, what we're learning about fasting states and the genes that get activated and all the longevity genes that get activated, I think there's a lot of arguing, uh, arguments that there's a lot of arguing in healthcare, of course, but there's, there's an increasing argument that you know, these types of, of eating plans really can promote health in a lot of patients. And what I like about it is kind of, it's evolved the conversation beyond like keto vegan, keto vegan, <laughs> where it's like, you know, you can get benefits of those styles of diets through um, incorporating more fasting and fasting plans um, uh, into your into your meals. Um, Dr. Deans, I could talk, talk to you all afternoon <laughs> long. Um, uh, thank you for for coming on board, everybody. This is this is Dr. Emily Deans. You can check out her blog, Hi. which is Evolutionary Psychiatry. She's a psychiatrist. She's affiliated with Harvard University. She's up in Massachusetts. And if you if you uh, hear of anybody who needs a great psychiatrist uh, near Boston, um, Dr. Deans is my go-to referral. And um, we're thank pretty you busy. All. But... 
Yeah, she's a little busy, but she's got some great <laughs> colleagues. And, and everybody, thank you so much for all the hearts. It's always a treat to see you all turning in from, tuning in from uh, around the world. We'll be back next Thursday with another special guest. And until then, you know what I'm going to say. Keep taking care of your mental health. Keep feeding your brain. Keep taking great care of your patients. And uh, keep doing everything that you're doing to keep your head up and to survive this very, very challenging time for all of us in healthcare. Until next week, everyone, I'll see you. And Emily, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you, Drew. Take care. Bye.